You're listening to a DM podcast. Turns out it wasn't an uneventful delivery. <laughs> when she started giving birth, we, we said, hey, that's not the head. It shouldn't be coming out this way. And it's a very, very serious medical emergency when anything but the head comes out first. Fortunately, the midwife from the RFDS walked through the door with, I'd say, seconds to spare. Yeah, so he, he saved the day for me, really. Still breathing okay at the moment. Is it a big property? That blood pressure is not coming up. Hi, my name is Lana Mitchell from the Royal Flying Doctor Service. This is a podcast about life in the bush, mateship, courage, and the role that the Royal Flying Doctor Service plays in serving rural and remote communities. This is the Flying Doctor Podcast. My name is Kira Lee Dargan from the Royal Flying Doctor Service and I'm an Aboriginal woman of the Wiradjuri Nation. This podcast has been recorded on Ngunnawal land and is being broadcast across all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander nations. We at the Royal Flying Doctor Service want to acknowledge Elders past and present. The RFDS recognises that this is First Peoples land and always will be. As I've mentioned many times in past podcast interviews, The Royal Flying Doctor Service is part of the national health system and we therefore work shoulder to shoulder with remote area nurses, local GPs, state provided health services, Aboriginal medical services and local hospital districts. This podcast is about the White Cliffs Health Service, which is the far west local health district. It's run by New South Wales Health and it's typical of a state based clinic that you'll find in any state of Australia. Now, to be clear for those that are unfamiliar with Whitecliffs, it's a small township in outback New South Wales. It's in the central Darling Shire, and it's about 255 kilometres northeast of Broken Hill and about almost 100 kilometres north of Wilcannia. So it's pretty much a long way away from most things. In the 2021 census, Whitecliffs had a population of 156, and there are many surrounding properties and stations that rely on White Cliffs for school and health and more. And there's a health clinic there that's manned by a registered nurse and an enrolled nurse during business hours. And the Royal Flying Doctor Service provide a fly-in, fly-out clinic there on location every week. And together, the state-based service and the RFDS provide emergency services 24-7. Now, we at the RFDS can't do our job without the assistance of the likes of Sam, who I'm interviewing today. These are some of the unsung heroes of the bush, in my opinion, and that's why I chose to interview Sam Shearer, so we can get a better understanding of what a Sydney boy is doing out in remote New South Wales, loving the community and the landscape and caring for the people of Whitecliffs. G'day, Sam. G'day, Lana. How are you? I'm good. How did you, as a Sydney boy, a registered nurse, end up in Whitecliffs? Look, I, I did my nursing and I've been out for four years now. Um, initially, I came out to the far west um, as a new grad, doing my rotation in the hospital of Bar Reynold for six months and Broken Hill Hospital for six months, where I worked on the surgical ward. I loved the bush from the get-go, really. Uh, the people, the culture, the nature, the work, the laid-back lifestyle and the lack of traffic. <laughs> right. So it was really just a, a natural fit to me to uh, to sort of stay out here and, and progress my career out here. I have worked in the city a little bit, but I find the people in the community, as I mentioned before, are just just top notch out here, and that's what really draws me out to the out to the bush. As a registered nurse, is it very different working there at Whitecliffs compared with working in a big city? Oh, it's it's uh it's like chalk and cheese, really. I don't have all the clinical support that you'd, you'd have in a big city hospital, supplies, sometimes you run out, sometimes you just don't have what you need. So it's very MacGyverish. You, you've got to make do with what you have. There's been plenty of occasions where you just simply don't have a 20-gauge cannula when in the city you'd, 20-gauge cannulas are everywhere, really. <laughs> um, so, yeah, yeah, it's it's very, very different. Can you describe for me what the landscape is like where you are and what the Whitecliffs Health Service building looks like? It's a oh, it's a small tin shack, really. <laughs> um, well, well equipped and with all with all the gears and gadgets you'd need to to run a resus in it. But it's not like a big city hospital. It's only a few a few rooms, a, a resus bay, a small supply closet, a little kitchenette, and that's about it. 
you don't have massive storerooms, you don't have x-ray departments, you don't have CT scanners, you don't have endless offices. It's just a building with a few rooms and a, a few beds. Where do you live, Sam? I'm staying in the in the flat just across from the hospital, so it's a three-second commute to work, uh, which is great. When I was living in Sydney, it used to take me 45 minutes to get to work. So a three-second commute is much appreciated. And when I first spoke to you on the phone, when we first uh, became acquainted, so to speak, you were out with the dogs and I was clarifying what that meant and you were explaining that one of the local residents nearby is in hospital at the moment and he has two dogs. Could you explain that to me? Yeah, so I had a call out to someone's house. We had to retrieve them and evac them to Adelaide, actually. Um, And, yeah, there were two dogs there that had no one to look after them. So I, and along with another local, took it upon ourselves to care for these dogs and, I don't know, check on them each day and give them food. Yeah, because they're, they're owners away in hospital. So it's just, just the little things you need to do to, to help out the community members in this town. Right. Well, I, I thought it was lovely. And you even sent me some photos of, of you with the dogs, which I will definitely post uh, relating to this podcast. Um, but it just sort of shows that, you know, everybody relies on everybody when it comes to small communities. Uh, could you describe, Sam, what a usual day for you is as a local registered nurse there in Whitecliffs? Yeah. So I start at 8.30 in the morning. Usually it's a coffee first thing in the morning. Um, and then I come and start start the book work. So that's making appointments for people, checking blood results, li- liaising with uh, with the RFDS doctors, chasing up uh, clients in town. Sometimes I'll, I'll get a call from uh, from the pub, just asking me to go check on someone or do a house call. Yeah, and in, in between that, I might get a couple of presentations a day, just someone needing some antibiotics. A farmer might have cut his finger, might need a couple of stitches. Really, anything and everything. Random. Random. Random would be the excellent <laughs> right word to describe it. And is and is that rewarding for you as as a nurse to be able to never really know what your day is going to hold and who you're going to meet or where you're going to be? Oh, it's it's incredibly re- rewarding. As a as an emergency nurse, you need to be prepared for anything and everything to walk through the door. But as a nurse working in the outback, you need to be prepared to take your work outside of the hospital and and do work outside of the hospital. Uh, attend MVAs, pick people up that have fallen over. MVA, motor vehicle accident? Motor vehicle accident, yep. Check on people's dogs if, if they need checking on. Um, conduct house calls to make sure people are all right. If you haven't heard from them or seen them in town in a couple of days, just might go visit them and make sure everything's all right. It's really the, the variety, as you, just, as you described, just the variety is the spice of life. Oh, that's fabulous. So... Um, because you work so remotely, has there been a time when you've been challenged? Um, you'd mentioned to me earlier that there was a heavily pregnant Aboriginal lady that came to you a little bit too late to get her to hospital. Yeah, I'll tell you that story, but I'll, I'll answer your question about being challenged. Every day, every day I'm challenged in my work, um, both clinically and I need to have the theoretical knowledge to to really cover a lot of bases. Because there's no doctor here, I need to be able to assess wounds make sure medications are, are all right. I need, to, I need to be able to cope with anything. But do you find that stressful, Sam, or is that exciting for you? Oh, it's exciting, very exciting. I, I take a real MacGyver approach to everything I do. There's always a solution. It might not be the solution you'd find in a big city hospital. You can't just go talk to a consultant. If, if I'm stuck, I'll, I'll call the RFDS doctor on call and run a few questions by him. The best work I could imagine. Tell me about this Aboriginal lady. So we had a an ambulance call out for a heavily pregnant lady in the community. She was, I don't know, 36, 37 weeks along. And usually in a big city hospital, she'd have the, the hospital 15 minutes down the road or an ambulance nearby. Anyway, she presented to the hospital. Um, and so we I called the RFPS and did my consult. And it was evident that she wasn't going to make it on the waiting for the hour for the RFPS to get there and then the... 45 minute retrieval back to Broken Hill. Birth was imminent. So we, we've got a maternity kit set up. So we set it up and I had the doctor on the phone and he was coaching me through it, telling me what I needed to prepare. I had the RFDS doctor on the camera as well. So he was able to make sure my setup was correct, make sure everything was where it needed to be, where the, the crib was set up, the, the humidifier lights were on. 
Are you a trained midwife, Sam? No, no. So have you delivered babies before? No, no, I haven't. So this was your first one? This was my first one. Okay. I have to ask, Sam, how old are you? 29. Okay, great. And you married? No, no. Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Just, so no children. <laughs> okay. So I, so, all right. So, so this is your first birth and you've got the RFGS doctor there on the screen, on the phone and, and coaching you through it. How was, how was this lovely mum? How was she doing? Was she worried or concerned or what? Could you tell me a little bit about how she was doing? She was all right. You know, I, I don't think she appreciated the, the full knowledge and the depth of how serious the situation was. Yeah, she was all right. She was calm. She was collected. She knew she had to have a baby. But I don't think she realised we'd prefer it to be in a in a midwifery ward and not a not a rural emergency department. So tell me what happened as you progressed. Well, I called my um, second in charge nurse in. She was starting at she was starting her shift later on in the day, and this woman she's the best nurse I've ever worked with. She's got 20, 20, 30 years of experience. She's had six kids of her own. She's very experienced. She's, she's birthed her own kids. She's birthed a few in the clinic. So I called her in on the phone. I said, quick, get here, quick. I need your, I need your help. Uh, yep. So she came in and, and checked, checked all the setup I was, I was setting up and said, yep, looks good. How's that? Uh, and she, she did her own assessment, of course, and caught up to speed with where, where, where we were at. And then it was just a waiting game, really. Waiting, waiting game until the birth happened. How long did you have to wait? Well, she got there maybe two hours from when she presented in the clinic until she actually gave birth. Right. So in hindsight, in a, in a perfect world with RFDS there dispatched ASAP, she may have made it to Broken Hill, but you can't really risk these things. You can't really risk them having given birth on a plane. Oh, yeah. No, we've the, definitely the policy is if um, at all costs we try not to have births on planes, it, it can present all sorts of problems. Mm, not a so was it a, a standard birth, no trouble? Well, we had a medical student and she is qualified to conduct deeper investigations. She was of the opinion that the head was in the right spot, the feet were in the right spot, and that it should, should be a uneventful delivery. Turns out it wasn't an uneventful delivery. Um, the baby was born in breach, which for the uninformed would be usually the baby comes out head first. And it's a very, very serious medical emergency when anything but the head comes out first. Um, you really need to have a, a full suite, preferably in an in a operating theatre or many, many midwives around to, to correct this as soon as possible. When she started giving birth, we, we said, hey, that's not the head. It shouldn't be coming out this way. What did you do? What happened? Well, fortunately, the midwife from the RFDS walked through the door with, I'd say, seconds to spare, walked through the door, did his quick assessment and said, hey, that's not happening the way it should be. So I watched in, in awe, in actual awe, as this midwife walked in the door, gloved up, sterile gloves, assessed the patient and just did his magic. He, he reached in, did a bit of a jiggle and... I don't want to sound crass or anything, but pulled it out the way it should it should come out. And look, I've never seen a birth before. I don't know how traumatic they're meant to be, but apparently they aren't always pretty. Yeah, so he, he saved the day for me, really. Wow. And and was, so that must have been quite an event for you, like your first birth, seeing your first birth and being there and being part of it. Did it impact you? Yeah, look, I, I've often thought about what it would be like to watch someone give birth. I'd always replayed the images in my mind as one day watching my wife give birth and I was always worried, oh, I don't know if I'm going to be able to handle this because I've seen videos of, of men fainting in the in the suites and I thought, gee, I hope that's not me. But once it happened, yeah, I, I wasn't feeling faint. I wasn't feeling scared. I was feeling a little bit nervous for the patient and the, the situation um, watching on as a and helping as a, as a clinician, but it was a beautiful moment and I didn't realise how, how beautiful it would be. I had I got teary and then I thought, you know what, This is a I see why people talk about birth as, as one of the most miraculous moments in people's lives. It's, it's honestly, until you've seen it, and I'm sure you have, hard, hard to put into words. It's a beautiful moment. Yeah, between Between being able to look after people at the en end of their life and provide palliative care and, and ease them into the next world quietly and peacefully 
just uh, yeah, helping new life come into the world is it's just as spectacular and rewarding moment. Yeah. How how was the mum and bub? Oh, she was fine. She was. I think she was glad it was was over. Very glad it was over. We couldn't give her any narco any morphine related painkillers because I think there there might be some interactions with the the morphine passing on to the baby. And there was a we have methoxyfluorine that we take out in the ambulance, commonly known as the green whistle. But policy prevents us from giving it to people in the ED. We can give it to people five metres out of the ED, but once she was in the ED, we couldn't give her this uh, methoxyfluorine. So that was a bit unfortunate. If we were in a big hospital, we could have given her nitrous nitrous gas and that would have helped mm-hmm. the, the birth be a lot less painful. But again, it just, it just goes to show that in these rural clinics, you don't have midwives, you don't have nitrous, you don't have... You don't have anything really. You've got your, you've got yourself, your skills. Yeah, and your knowledge, and your knowledge, and community. So, so it all went well then. So, did that mum and bub um, just go home, or what happened? Did they end up being transported to be like, what happened to them then? No, I think there is an initiative. Obviously, it's a high risk birth, and in in a remote community. So, the the government, in all its wisdom, has enacted a few policies to prevent unnecessary and unfortunate deaths after birth so the mm. rps the, the midwife and the doctor whisked the patient and the bub onto the plane we actually had to wait for a second plane with a set up for a, a newborn so the second plane came after a few hours and whisked them off to a tertiary center just to make sure that everything was good yeah everything was yeah. well oh that's that's a great story yeah it was uh it was a lovely story and it really i I keep saying for the past few years, yeah, yeah, I'll do my midwifery at some point, but the calls are getting stronger internally. So I think I need to um, to enrol on a midwifery course just so next time it happens, I, I'll be a bit more prepared. Yeah, but also you can be involved in that, the joy of bringing new life into the world on a regular basis. It'd be pretty amazing. Yeah, of, course, of course. Yeah. Well, you were mentioned it just a moment ago that there's two really pivotal points where we help people. One is that point of birth and the arrival of new life and the other one is that end of life. Mm. Have you had to experience that yourself um, in terms of your role as a nurse in that uh, small community? Yeah, so as there's no ambulance service in in these communities I work in, uh, the RNs are often required to staff the ambulance and respond to the triple zero calls. One day I received a triple zero call for a patient in cardiac arrest and I've never attended an arrest or led an arrest. It's always a terrifying moment. So anyway, look, I, I attended this arrest. It was clear when I when I got there that it, the patient had been in an arrest for some time and any attempt that we made would would be very futile. Now, I just wanted to, I wanted to say one quick thing, Sam, because you're talking from a small community where we don't want patients to be identifiable, mm. um, we're just going to refer to this patient as the patient and we're not going to talk about their gender or their age just yeah. because compared with the city where you can talk about a person and they can never be actually identifiable, when you're talking about such small communities, mm. they can be quite easily. So um, that's just to be clear for listeners as to why we're talk- talking in sort of general terms about this one. So, yeah, I attended this arrest and I ran through the algorithms as, as prescribed. I followed the ALS protocol and I was surprised by how fluid how fluidly that came to me. We, we always train for arrests and I, I reckon I ran it pretty well. What, what is that? What is that protocol? So advanced life support, chest compressions, adrenaline, oxygen. Yeah, essentially that's it. And it works really well in a, in a fully staffed hospital, and but the survival rate of, a, of an outside arrest isn't great, and especially someone who's been arresting for quite a while, the likelihood of getting them back, getting return of spontaneous circulation is is very, very minimal. So I knew walking into this into this house that that it probably wasn't going to be a successful attempt. And as I debriefed with the New South Wales, New South Wales Ambulance afterwards, I was kind of in two minds, A, should I start or B, should I just call it at the scene? And they, they provided me with excellent support and encouragement when they said, look, in the in the absence of a clear and identify, identifiable cause of death, you kind of need to start. Um, and, and if there's no valid do not resuscitate forms in front of you, you, you have to start no matter how, how grim the prospects look. So anyway, I started, I led the resus pretty well actually. 
and I had the I had the doctor on the on the phone with me, just on loudspeaker in the background, so he could hear what was going on. We did a few rounds of compressions. We were looking for a shockable rhythm. There was no shockable rhythm. She, they, the patient remained in, in assistly the entire time. So does that mean, just sorry to clarify, but does that mean that basically there was no pulse, there was no breath? Yeah, there was there was no no pulse, no cardiac, no electrical activity in the in the heart. Right. Per the ALS guidelines, there are only two shockable rhythms, which a lot of non-medical listeners would be surprised by. They think, oh, someone has an arrest, you just shock them. It doesn't always work that way. And so that's the point of advanced life support. You try and coach that heart back into a shockable rhythm when there's a, a rhythm that can be identified either VT or VF, that's when you shock and that's when you have the opportunity to restart the heart. Um, mm. but if there's no shockable rhythm, you can't do anything. So you just continue compressions and try and coax the heart back into some sort of electrical activity. Unfortunately, we couldn't get any electrical activity. So yeah, I needed to make a decision then and there. Do we continue putting the the family, the family were outside, do we continue the, the gruesome scene inside or do we take them back to the hospital and declare life extinct? And I was, I was speaking with the RFDS doctor on the phone at the time and I was running through the ALS protocol, I was running through the reversible causes of cardiac arrest. So you've got the four H's and the four T's. It was likely that this patient had suffered a cardiac arrest in her sleep, just natural causes. They were an elderly, elderly individual. There was nothing more we could do for them at the scene. Even if they're in a big city hospital, nothing more that they could do for them there either. So the RFDS doctor on the phone was very good in talking me through my decision-making. We took the patient back to the hospital and essentially declared them deceased at the hospital. Did, did, um, did the family uh, come with you or, or how were they coping with this? They turned up at the hospital shortly after, um, expecting, expecting an answer as to what was happening, how was, how was my loved one. We had the police on scene as well, so they were able to provide a little bit of crowd control and sort of ease the, ease the I won't say tensions, but you could imagine a, a cardiac arrest and a recess could be quite a traumatic scene for family members mm -hmm. to see. So the police were very good. They they spoke with the family, let them know how things are going, what the likely outcome outcomes were, and essentially they they handled the PR for us while we were inside, making phone calls, speaking with the doctors, doing our medical stuff. But I, I look, I, I didn't speak with the family afterwards. Yeah, did you did that impact on you heavily, Sam? It actually did. In the in the weeks afterwards, you always hear about emergency responders having PTSD and and shock and reliving the events. I was reliving the events quite a bit, actually. I didn't think I would. I'd never run a resus before. I, look, I've seen a few and I've helped out a few, in a few in a few big city hospitals, but actually being there and essentially leading it, it was quite quite surreal. Um, so I was reliving the events for a couple of weeks afterwards. Um, but thankfully, nothing super depressing. I could imagine big city paramedics who are doing this day in, day out. It could be quite mentally draining and emotionally, yeah, emotionally draining for them. Um, but I, I'm just very thankful I don't have to do it every day like some of my colleagues do. Did the RFDS follow up with you afterwards to make sure you were okay? Yeah. So this doctor that I was chatting with on the phone, I had actually consulted him I, I, was, I, I attended a motor vehicle accident that same day and I was on the side of the road and I was speaking with him. So I think he was a bit shocked when two hours later I gave him another call saying, yeah, I'm, I'm in the middle of an arrest. Um, this doctor, look, I can't remember his name. I can remember I can remember the kindness and compassion he spoke to me with. From the, from the MBA earlier on in the day to the arrest that I led later on in the day, he was just top-notch. Throughout, throughout the whole thing, talking me through it, guiding me, asking me questions. And then and then he reached out to me the next morning and said, hey, let's have a chat, let's have a, have a debrief. How are you going? What's what's going through your head? So we actually, yeah, we, we chatted on the phone for about 45 minutes in the wee hours of the next morning. He was based in Wollongong. I was based in far west New South Wales, so a distance of 1,200 kilometres. 
And yeah, look, that just doesn't happen in any other industry, any other profession. Yeah, the, the kindness and compassion that doctor showed to me was just, I can't thank him enough. He really helped me feel at peace with my decision making. And that's probably why I don't have so many flashbacks and, and regrets about the whole incident, the kindness and compassion he showed me. When there's a death in a small community like that, um, it often has quite a significant impact on the community itself. Did you find that then that um, the loss of that person ended up being relived at the pub and relived at, um, you know, the local gatherings and so forth? Yeah, of course. When, as, as you said, whenever there's a death in the community, unlike, unlike the city where people sort of just move on a little bit quicker, um, it's all they talked about for weeks and it's all they... Yeah, small communities, the death of a loved one hits hits hard. I'm not going to say hits harder than in the city, but it's 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 a smaller place. It's harder to get away from these things. But it's different too, isn't it? Because I live in a small community, a small rural community, and whenever there's a death here, it's quite interesting, I've noticed, because uh, community members come together to help. There's action that's needed after the passing of somebody that's loved in the community and, and people come together. And, in fact, um, here locally we had a, the passing of a, a much-loved community member last year and they're still writing, you know, um, his accolades in the community newspaper and working to get him some awards, you know. Uh, you know, so it's sort of... Yeah, it's quite, in my experience, when there's the passing of somebody in a small community, it, it actually has a larger impact because communities are only as strong as, as those community people that make them up. I guess I'm in a privileged position of, I wouldn't say, well, I would say being an outsider. I, I come in, do a few months here, do a few months there. So while I would form bonds with certain individuals in the community, I, I don't form particularly strong bonds with everyone. So I, I am protected in that sense. But I, I do I do hear what you're saying. So when you go down to the pub, is it strange to be seeing people that you were seeing as a patient earlier in the day? Initially I thought it would be, but you get drilled pretty hard in, in nursing school about privacy, patient confidentiality. So you learn pretty quick not to post things on Facebook, not to gossip, not to not to talk about things that aren't work related outside of work. At work, yeah. you, you talk about what needs to be talked about, but the moment my the moment my uniform comes off, I I don't, I don't talk about things outside of work. That's a good practice. Regarding your comment about seeing people at the pub, oh, it's, I love it. I love seeing my patients at the pub. <laughs> seeing seeing them get better. You might treat them one day. They might be real crook. You might fly them out. You might be real worried about them. You'll, you'll think about them the, over the night. You'll think about them the next day you'll wonder when you're going to see them again. And then you'll see them down the street. You'll see them walk on their dog. You'll see them at the pub having a schooner. It's a beautiful thing. It's a beautiful thing. You, you don't you don't see your patients in the city outside of work. Um, but, <laughs> Which may be a good thing sometimes. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure it would be. <laughs> do, the, do the locals tell you uh, their views on health provision and, and so forth? Oh, they do. They do. They love to... They love to give me recommendations, things I couldn't, things the health service could improve on, things. They, they love to chat about about health. I need to be very careful and steer them away from certain conversational topics, but generalised topics they'll, they'll talk about. I had a patient last week at the pub. Um, well, not a patient. I haven't actually treated this person, but a, a community member, and he was telling me a story. In in Wycliffe's, I, I, remember, I recall you saying the population at the last census was 176 or so. That's a low estimate, to be honest. There's plenty of, of travellers travelers that come in and, and come and go. And during the winter months, the, the population of Whitecliffe swells considerably to, say, four or 500. This individual was telling me that in the winter months, it gets really annoying because these, these people from the big cities that come in and want to spend the winter in, in a beautiful dugout, they often take the, the appointments of, of the locals. So medical provision is harder to obtain during the winter months just because of the increased demand. And look, I get it. I really get it. So I said to him, look, let me let me speak to my boss and see if we can get an extra doctor out here or a doctor on two days of the week instead of one. I haven't heard any feedback from, from RFDS about that yet. But look, if anyone from the RFDS, any bosses are listening, Whitecliffs needs an extra doctor in the winter months. 
just because of the increased demand. It's it's an interesting thing because it's not just white cliffs either. It happens in Broken Hill. It happens. It's um, you tend to get during the cooler months of the year. You get this migration that mm. occurs, and it's and it's not just from Sydney. It's from Melbourneites and Brisbaneites and you know grey nomads on the move. And um, it's an interesting conundrum because while those people are travelling and moving and enjoying uh, their winter in a different location, they sometimes don't realise the impact that they have on the local health services. No. So, uh, yeah, yeah. That's, that's a great point. Our resources are stretched, sometimes very stretched, but, look, I love what I do. I love, I love the challenges of providing healthcare with limited resources and making a difference in, in people's lives. The innovation the, the RFDS has, the GPs, the, the RFDS nurses, the primary health nurses, are all top notch, best in the field, they can do anything. Thank you so much, Sam, for giving us a snapshot into White Cliffs and the work that you do. I think you're one of the great unsung heroes of our health system. So thanks so much for walking us through just a little bit of a, a day in your life. Thanks for having me on. I've really enjoyed it. Thanks for listening. Word of mouth is always the best promotion for a podcast. So if you enjoy this podcast or a specific story, please share with family and friends. If you haven't already, join our Facebook group called the Flying Doctor Podcast Community. And you can also send feedback, questions or comments to me directly at lana.mitchell at rfds.org.au. Donations to support the Royal Flying Doctor Service can always be made through our website at flyingdoctor.org.au. The Flying Doctor podcast was presented by me, Lana Mitchell, and senior producer is Mandy Coolen. Mm-hmm.